Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Confronting Evil. Tonight, we catch up with the other half. So, sit back, relax, and get ready for Confronting Evil. Eric and Stephen sat by a brilliant fire in what could have been the center of a dense and dark forest. It was springtime, and the two teenage outdoor enthusiasts could wait no longer for warm weather to spend some time outdoors. Eric was tall and a bit heavier set, but he loved fishing and camping as much as anyone else. Stephen was tall and lanky, and he had an inherent love for long outdoor hikes and kayaking. But sitting beneath the stars beside their tents, sipping suds and smoking buds, was where they found their common ground. It had gotten late in the evening, but the duo barely even noticed the steep drop in temperature due to the roaring fire and the extra goodies that Eric had brought along. Stopping at the local head shop, looking to score some weed for the weekend, he was pleased to find that they also had magic mushroom chocolate bars on hand. Eric couldn't resist and when he pulled them out for him and Stephen, neither of them hesitated in each eating a half a bar. Now, the alcohol, the marijuana, and the mushroom chocolates were all working in perfect harmony. Eric would say something benign, and Stephen would simply fall out of his chair, hysterical with laugh, which in turn would cause him to say or do something absurd, causing Eric to do the same, and round and round the pair went for what seemed like hours. Listen, dude, I gotta take a piss. I'll be right back. Eric stood and informed Stephen of his intent. Stephen would have said something to him in return, but his mind went wild with a hundred things to say, causing him to fail to blurt out any of them. But with that, Eric turned and disappeared into the dark woods to relieve himself. Stephen sat, awe inspired by the roaring flames before him. A few moments later, he was brought out of his trance by the sounds of violent thrashing coming from the woods nearby. Stephen turned to look, to find a hysterical Eric burst from the underbrush. Dude, there's a fucking naked girl standing in the woods, Eric exclaimed. Stephen sat there, too astonished to respond at first, but eventually asked him to repeat himself. I said... There's a naked girl, just standing in the woods, Eric repeated. Uh, is she hot? Stephen immediately asked. No, dude, well, kinda, I guess, but that's not the point, Eric continued. Eric looked scared and panicked, and this made no sense to Stephen. Does she need help? He began to ask. No, I don't think so. Something's not right with her, dude. She, like walks backwards, all skittery. What? Stephen almost laughed. Dude, how many chocolates did you eat? <laughs> what the fuck was that? Stephen was the first to speak. It sure as fuck isn't chocolate mushrooms, Eric affirmed. Dude, I'm tripping too hard for this shit. And then, the pair watched a slender, naked girl emerge from the forest into their firelight. She was completely naked. Her hair was long and dark, and just as Eric said, for some reason, she walked backwards toward them. Dude, you're seeing this shit, right? Eric asked. Unfortunately, yeah, I think so, Stephen confirmed. Once the girl had gotten close enough, Eric was the first brave enough to reach out and touch her shoulder, to ask her what was wrong, although there was something about her that made him incredibly uneasy. But before he could land a glance, her form spun around, but seemed to transform in an instant as she turned. Now she was a beastly monster with a coyote-like snout, large lemur-like eyes, and large protrusions that jutted from both of its elbows like spikes adorned on arms that were now far too long for the being that nearly dragged them on the ground. The thing instead reached out and touched Eric, causing him to instantly collapse to the ground. Stephen wasn't proud, but also wasn't thinking. He ran when he saw the thing, 
he left his friend behind to die. And all he heard as he did, thrashing through the forest, as fast as his legs would carry him, were the sounds of bones being ripped from sockets and meat being torn. He stopped for a moment, almost to the road. Everything went silent. The thing lunged at him, and Stephen met the same fate. I don't see what this has to do with much of anything. Why are you forcing me to ride off into the sunset to go throw down with some damn thing that is not a damn thing to do with a damn thing? Seth's passenger said. First off, you're the only damn thing I see around here. Being damned and all. Second, it has to do with doing what's right. Something you wouldn't know much of anything about. And thirdly, no one dragged you anywhere. You refuse to leave me alone, Seth responded. You're at a critical state with your quote-unquote training. Besides, I don't have anything better to do, unlike some of us. The man responded back, inflecting his last words directly at Seth. Well, with nothing better to do, you could have found us a better ride, Kramer. Where the hell did you find this jalopy anyway? Hell? Seth remarked on the beat-up pickup that chugged down the road. No, close, Detroit, Kramer said with such a seriousness that Seth would have laughed had he not known better. What the hell were you doing in Detroit? Seth asked him. Besides stealing this truck, collecting some dividends. What kind of dividends? D you know what? Never mind. I don't want to know. Especially with you. So, what are we hunting anyways? Kramer asked with curiosity. Actually, I was kind of hoping you could help me with that. A lot of these reports are very conflicting. I'm not even convinced we're hunting a single thing. Some people say it mimics animal noises. Others say it can mimic human voices. Some say it looks like some kind of were coyote beast thing. Others say it takes the form of a wandering native woman. Seth explained. Then how do you know it's a single creature? Kramer asked. Well, I don't. Not really. But there's this old man who lives around here that was more than happy to share what he knows. Had one hell of a story to tell, and the scars to fortify what he said to boot. I guess no one knows what the damn thing's called, but he says it can change from a woman to beast in an instant, and can paralyze with his touch. He calls it a familiar. Well, that's a stupid name. Well, how much further until we get where we're going? You finish your business? And we can get back to the work at hand. Cool your pants on fire over there, you demonic son of a bitch. This is our exit, Seth assured him, pulling off the highway ramp and towards a small town in northern Oregon. The sky was gray and overcast, and it had become late in the afternoon by the time Seth had arrived on the scene. The beat-up pickup truck pulled into place in what was noted as a game preserve. It was a large section of land where camping of any kind was strictly prohibited, and hunting was only permissible via very difficult to obtain permits from the county clerk's office. In the desolate dirt lot, surrounded on all sides by the dense forest, was only one other vehicle. Seth knew it was the individual he was there to meet, ascertained by observing the decaled logo imprinted on the side of the vehicle, indicating that it belonged to a forest ranger. And Seth already knew which ranger it was. Ranger Thompson, I presume? Seth spoke out to the man in uniform, standing beside the vehicle as he exited his own. The man was tall, slightly overweight, and although much of his large ranger hat hid most of it, it was visible that he was going bald. Yeah, uh, and you must be Agent Pleasance? Ranger Thompson responded. Yes, and please, you can call me Donald if it's easier. Seth said, flashing his badge and immediately putting it away. He could tell the man wasn't interested in taking a closer look. Who's your friend? Is he your partner? Thompson said, nodding towards the other man stepping out of the pickup. 
Kramer spoke up, saying in fact they were partners in crime. Indeed. What he means is, yes, we're partners. And I've been trapped in a car with this thing for so long, it should be a crime. You're the one that eats beans and hummus and stinks up the car. Really, the darkest pits of hell can't compare to your stench. Kramer said with a sneer. Taken many trips to hell, have you? Ranger Thompson said, joining in on the joke. Well, actually, now that you mention it. Kramer began, but Seth cut him off. How about we just go right down to business, Ranger? Where did you say those kids were camping out? Seth interjected with a question. Oh, just a ways out yonder, about a mile deep, he said, pointing off into the forest leading deeper into the woods and away from civilization, or what passed for it around here. Seth, Ranger Thompson, and Kramer all began their trek deeper into the woods, into the thick canopied trees, blockading the light of the setting sun. The trio walked and talked for nearly an hour, before Ranger Thompson pointed towards a bare patch of earth with a stony, sooty mound in the center. If the ranger hadn't been shining his light on it directly, both Kramer and Seth would have passed the spot up entirely, now completely enshadowed by nightfall. That's the spot. Those poor kids were camping right over there. Sissy. What the hell? I think... I think what he means to say is that the kids surely paid for their petty crime, Seth said, trying to provide cover for his demonic companion. Yeah, I'll say. Trespassing is a misdemeanor. I think disembowelment and being partially eaten is a bit of a severe punishment for the crime. Well, not if you come from where I come from. What? Where the hell do you come from? Thompson asked in exasperation. Yeah, Detroit, Seth said trying to deflect Kramer's statement with the first thing that came to mind. Wow, cops are really dropping the hammer out that way to clean up those streets, huh? Thompson laughed, joining in on a conversation that he assumed to be a joke. Seth walked over to the burned out pit and asked Kramer to accompany him. He had hoped maybe there was something that Kramer could detect that he couldn't, possibly giving Seth an edge on this elusive foe. But Kramer either found nothing of note, or shared nothing and lied. Unfortunately, there was no more time for contemplation. A sharp snap of a twig caused Thompson to spin and shine his light into the woods, and both Seth and Kramer to turn and look with him. Miss? Miss, stay right there. Do you need assistance? Can you tell me what you're doing out here? Thompson shouted out commands and questions alike shakily holding his flashlight on the form as her appearance filled him with a unsettling feeling. In the forest, amongst the trees, stood what they saw as a slender girl of moderate height, and her long black hair that hung down to the middle of her back, almost unnoticeably swaying in the forest wind, and she was stark naked. The girl stood with her back to the three men behind her, stock still, and didn't say a word. Hey, Seth, I mean, Agent Pleasance, or whatever. You know that's not what it appears to be, right? Kramer asked Seth, who now stood right next to him. Yeah, I figured. But how can you tell? Seth asked in return. Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting. You can't see her aura and shit, right? Yeah, basically, that's not a girl. It's part of something else. I don't know. I've traveled the nine circles of hell. Part of a vacation I took a few decades ago. But I've never seen anything like that. Kramer stated to Seth, giving no mind to the present company. What the? Who the hell are you two? Really? And what the hell are you actually doing out here? Traveling through hell? Seeing auras? I want to see your badges again. You two are loony as fuck. What's going on here? Thompson looked at Kramer and Seth, demanding an explanation. Seth opened his mouth to reply, another well-plotted lie at the ready, but Kramer just sneered, chuckled softly, and pointed at Ranger Thompson. At least, that's what Thompson and Seth both thought at first. But in the next instant, both men realized that Kramer was pointing past Ranger Thompson towards something behind him, 
In his haste to make demands at Seth and Kramer, Thompson turned away from what he thought was a naked girl, and now, turning to see what Kramer was pointing and snickering at, Thompson was greeted with the same girl, only now she was close enough for him to reach out and touch her. Miss? Are you okay? Can, can you look at me? Thompson asked, reaching out to grip the girl by the shoulder. Ranger, no! Seth shouted, but it was too late. The man gripped the girl's shoulder so as to spin her to face him, but when he did, he both dropped instantly to the forest floor like a sack of potatoes, and the thing turned with inhuman speed to both face Seth and Kramer. Only now, the thing was no longer a girl. It was instead a tall and lanky beast, covered in fur, with yellow, lemur-like eyes too large for its head, and a coyote-like snout, protruding from the backs of its elbows, were two long spikes or tendrils. Kramer and Seth took a step back. Seth was unsure of what it was he was dealing with, and Kramer had no intention of getting involved in the first place. The beast stared and sneered at the pair before looking down to the forest floor at the man lying at its feet. Thompson did not move, didn't make a sound, but the fear in his trembling eyes and the water that leaked from them told Seth that he was still very much alive and aware. So what's the plan? Did you learn anything useful like you hoped? Or are you ready to do things my way? Kramer asked. No, I'll do this my way. I'll just kill the fucking thing. That sounds more like your sister's way. Seth glared at Kramer for his remark, and as he did, the beast lunged downward and gripped its teeth onto Thompson's throat. No, wait! Seth yelled, but it was too late. In the next instant, the thing reared its head back upward to look at Seth, ripping flesh with it. Seth pulled free both his pistol and his iron knife and looked to Kramer, asking for assistance. Nope, you're on your own. Besides... That thing can't kill me anyways. Might make a good pet, though. Kramer joked, but Seth was already into a full-out sprint. Shooting at the creature as he ran, he found that bullets seemed to do absolutely nothing. Seth never broke stride, and he knew his next idea would require getting in close. However, he'd heard the stories and seen the effects firsthand, and he knew he couldn't so much lay a single finger on the thing, lest he be paralyzed as well. As he approached it, the creature reared back and swung a long, lanky clawed arm at Seth, but its limb was so large, it telegraphed its attack, making it easy for Seth to leap over it, plant his knife directly into the skull of the abomination, and then land squarely on his feet. Seth hoped that this would do the trick. Hell, it seemed to work at least half the time for Mackenzie, but the thing turned to look at him and kind of smiled, gripping the knife at the handle pulling it from its skull and throwing it to the ground. Seth sighed, but he had seen this as a possibility as well. As the thing trudged forward toward him, Seth pulled a small inscription written on a piece of paper from his pocket, and about halfway to him, he had all but finished reciting the words. And there was a bright flash and a thunderous boom, and when the light receded, Seth knew the thing would be gone. And as he rubbed his eyes and readjusted his vision to his surroundings. The beast was nearly upon him, and Seth knew that he was wrong. But that was a banishment spell. Seth yelled out into the universe itself, knowing that no one was there that could hear him with any humanity in their soul, and that he was completely out of options now, all but doomed. The beast howled and leapt through the air. Seth winced, and... nothing. Nothing happened. The sounds of the forest went silent once more. Seth opened a single eye and then both to find the beast. Gone. You can thank me later, Kramer said, dusting off his hands as if he had done hard labor recently. For what? What happened? I saved your sissy human butt. That's what happened. You killed it? No. I actually don't have the power to kill that thing, either, but I did send it away. Wait, where? Nebraska. What? Why Nebraska? Seth asked, confused. I owe a guy some money there, and this is just easier than paying off my debt. You know what? Never mind. How come my banishment spell didn't work? 
It's like I told you before, Seth. The book has indeed had its effect on you. That effect being opening you up to have an effect on the book. Kramer replied. I don't understand. Your spell didn't work. Not because it doesn't work. But because you're bound with a spell. The book itself isn't strong enough. Now, I can increase your bond with a book. But you know the price. You know I can't. So, you're just gonna let those innocent people die? Your mother? Your sister? Die? Seth didn't respond to this question, and after a long pause, Kramer simply vanished, leaving Seth to clean up the mess of their wake. He knew that he would be back, though. He didn't say it out loud, and he thought about it all the way back to the truck. As Seth reached his vehicle, his phone rang. It was Mackenzie, and this time, Seth would pick up. He would hear all that Mackenzie had to say after they exchanged their happy greetings in their own sibling ways, and Seth would agree to help Mackenzie put a stop to Iridus once and for all, but only this time he would be doing it his way. Well, it seems that Seth has decided to rejoin Mackenzie, but what kind of new dynamic will ensue once the two are back together? You won't have to wait long to find out. Confronting Evil returns next month. Social media can be very unpredictable, especially regarding horror content. If this content gets removed, all new content will be simultaneously presented on various websites provided in the description to this video. Make sure to follow me in other digital spaces so that you never miss out on the terror. Also, if you like this video, make sure to leave a comment and hit the like button. It helps the channel a lot. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy what's here, consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Writing is a dream of mine, and it's all of you that make that dream come true.